the wake of the recent Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriages, Emily Stimson, a Catholic laywoman, wrote an open letter to priests and bishops. The letter, entitled What Catholics Need Now, a letter to our priests and bishops, detail what she believes are five things, five steps, action items, if you will, that need to be taken by priests and bishops. I want to address this letter. I think it's an important letter. I posted it on my Facebook page uh, to see what other Catholics thought of it and got some mixed responses. Many people thought she was right on the mark, and some other people said, oh my goodness, not this again. But I think it's important to address this letter. I want to be clear in addressing this letter. I'm doing this as an individual priest myself. Um, I'm not doing it on behalf behalf of a diocese, behalf of the church, or anything like that. So you're receiving my own personal opinion on these uh, issues that she has. The first thing that she would like addressed is preaching the faith. She says when she comes to Mass on Sundays, she doesn't need to be told to be nice. She needs to be called to holiness. And I think there's truth to that. I think that Catholic preaching has, in a sense, become a little bit tepid and timid. Uh, Many times priests and bishops are afraid of addressing certain issues for in fear of alienating a congregation or for fear of coming off as crass and cruel. Um, I've experienced this myself. I tend to address a lot of issues head on, and I face a lot of resistance when I do that. But I think it's important to do that because our faith calls us to holiness, and we have to preach the truths of the faith, whether or not they're popular, whether or not it's what our people want to hear. So it's important for us to do that. In addition, she says, it's not just the priests who need to do this at the Sunday homilies. This needs to be done in conjunction with a greater catechesis, a greater teaching of the faith, that directors of religious education and youth ministry ministers and other people need to be proclaiming the faith as well and teaching us the faith. A lot of times what gets taught is a watered-down Catholicism. And to that, I definitely would have to agree. As somebody who grew up in the 80s, uh, my generation, and myself in particular, was taught Jesus loves you and God loves you. But that's about as far as our education went in terms of the faith. We were never taught what that meant. We were never called to conversion. We were never taught um, the truths that Jesus taught us, the way of life that he gave us. And so in, in many respects, there is a whole generation that hasn't been properly catechized, and we need to teach them the truths of the faith, um, not just the simple message that God loves you, but also the way of life that Christ has given us and how we're to live that way of life. The second thing that Ms. Dimson asks for is the use of Canon 915 of the Code of Canon Law. So the Code of Canon Law is this uh, giant book here that I have. It's the Church's um, law, so to speak. It is our Code of Law in the Church. And Canon 915 states, Those who are excommunicated or or interdicted after the imposition or declaration of the penalty and others who have obstinately persisted in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. Specifically, she wants this canon applied to politicians. So she's saying we should not admit to Holy Communion politicians who are holding positions that are in grave opposition to the Catholic Church. Specifically, she cites Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden, and presumably talking about their persistence in promoting abortion, and and perhaps same-sex marriage as as well. Um, Certainly, People have thrown in, I've heard it, uh, seen it around the internet, uh, Mario Cuomo, my own governor. So it's important for us to look at this. To this point, I would say, I'm I'm not a bishop, I can't enforce uh, Canon 915 amongst these politicians. But I would say this, I think it's important that we take our laws seriously, whether it be our canon laws, our liturgical laws, whether it be the divine law that we receive from God. Because if we don't take our own laws seriously, how can we expect other people to take us seriously, or to take them seriously? Um, What's the point of having a law, so to speak, if you're not going to to enforce it? So I think we do need to take our laws seriously. So to that point, I would certainly uh, say that I think I think Ms. Stimson has a valid point. However, in the specific instances, I can't say that I've had conversations. I, I know the bishops have probably had conversations and priests have probably had conversations with these politicians. And the best we can do is to, to yield to their judgment at this point. Um, again, I'm not saying their judgment is, is right or wrong because I haven't been privy to those conversations. But I hate to jump to a conclusion. But at the same time, I understand the point that from where most Catholics are sitting, uh, it certainly seems that they are persisting in grave sin. And it seems that there's no consequence for doing that and that we are are allowing them to receive communion while they really aren't in communion with us because they're holding positions that are uh, antithetical to the teachings of the Catholic Church. Her third point is to clean house. She says there's too many people working in leadership positions of the church who are dissenting from church teachings. Um, so she's saying that the church should be welcoming. She does say this to, to everyone, to uh, sinners as well as to saints. 
But she says, in leadership positions, we need people who are faithful and good role models. And to that, I'd certainly agree. We do need people who are faithful and who are good role models. To the extent that somebody is not, I think they, the question should be raised. Um, is this person the proper person to have in this position for ministry? Um, again, I'm not saying, I wouldn't use the phrase clean house. I wouldn't say that we just go and fire everybody today. Um, but I would say that I think it's important for us to look over the codes of conduct that various dioceses and various parishes have and make sure that our staff understand the teachings of the Catholic Church and are willing to abide by these teachings if they want to work in a leadership position for the Catholic Church. Because as a leader, it's hard to be credible if you're going to be living a lifestyle or espousing views that are separate from those which you are preaching publicly as a minister of the church. So I think it's important for our leaders to be doing this. You know, this is why the priest sex abuse scandal was so scandalous and so problematic. Um, I mean, certainly the, the, the sin itself was, was egregious, but the fact that that it came from people who were in leadership positions. And as a result, it's discredited myself and many other priests because we're categorized as people who are hypocrites and people who don't really espouse to these positions they're, they're clinging to. It's so important for leaders of any organization to actually embrace what it is their organization is about. And it's certainly true of the church where we're dealing about with eternal truths and the salvation of souls and divine realities, that we understand these realities and that we are firmly committed to them if we're going to be proclaiming them to the rest of the world. Her fourth point is she says, give us beauty. She's talking about the liturgy. She says that our liturgies shouldn't be forms of entertainment, but they should express our beliefs and they should express the beauty uh, that comes from being in a relationship with God, the beauty of our worship. They should first and foremost be about worship and it's worship of a transcendent God who is beyond us. So our liturgy should call us beyond ourselves. And to this point, I'd say certainly she's right. We have liturgical laws. And again, as I said, if we have these laws in this way that liturgy is to be celebrated, that's what we should follow. We shouldn't be making up our own things or trying to make the liturgy, you know, cutesy and homey or a form of entertainment. Not to say it can't be entertaining, but it should primarily be about worship. And we should follow. We are a ritualistic people, so we should follow the rituals of our faith and bring out the beauty in our liturgy because we have a beautiful faith. We've got a beautiful liturgy and we need to make that scene so that people can understand the beauty of being in this relationship with God. Finally, she says that we need to prepare for persecution. Amen to that. Um, I, I seriously believe that the Catholic Church, as uh, Ms. Dimson does, is in a position where we're going to face more persecution in the future. Um, certainly, our values are not shared in many respects with the rest of our society. Some of them are, but a lot of them stand anti antithetical to what a lot of our society believes, uh, specifically issues of contraception, sexuality, same-sex marriage, um, abortion, human life, these types of things. A lot of people do not share our values. And so we have to prepare to be persecuted persecuted. But we also have to remember that we believe that we have the fullness of truth in the Catholic Church. And if we do have the fullness of truth, we can't run away from it or turn from it just because society wants us to or it's not popular. We have to stick with what we know to be true. And we have to preach that faithfully, even in the midst of persecution. So while we might not face the type of martyrdom that the early apostles or the early church faced, I do think that we are going to face some kind of persecution and backlash for our beliefs. But it's important for us to remember that our beliefs are true and that they come from God and that we live in union with God who is truth. And so we do need to be ready to face that persecution, but always take comfort in the fact that we know that we are sticking up for a divine reality, for something that's beyond us, and for something that is in fact true. So I think Miss Stempson's letter, um, it certainly is a good reflection point for us in the church. Um, I think she left out some things, too. Um, one of the most difficult teachings of the church um, Pope Francis has been calling us to is this issue of how we treat the poor and the marginalized. Um, and I think that's really important for us to look at as well. So I would add that to her thesis here, or to her, her, wish, her wish list, so to speak, is that we truly do become a church of the poor. And that's probably the area where I struggle the most in my own life, and I think a lot of people do, is, is how we treat the poor um, and how we live our lives in this country vis-a-vis -vis the fact that there are many people in our world who are starving, who don't have their basic needs met, and whose human dignity is denied them. So I think that the letter isn't comprehensive, but certainly I think it's not a bad starting point for some reflection in our Catholic faith.